Hi there. In this video, we're going to talk about structure and symmetry in geometry. We're going to begin with some simple shapes, and then we're going to move on to the structure and symmetry of what we will call the affine plane in geometry. So let's start with the simplest shape of all, perhaps, uh, the square. So we're all familiar with the structure of the square and the symmetries of the square. The symmetries of the square are the rotational symmetries and also this reflectional symmetry here. Um, I want to distinguish between the structural characteristics of the square and the symmetry characteristics of the square. So let me let me talk about what I mean precisely. The square has certain internal features. It has points, it has lines, it has this internal area. It also has color, although we won't treat that as geometrically relevant when we're doing abstract geometry in mathematics. Um, so these are the internal characteristics. These things have measures. I can measure the area of the square. If I have, since this is a real, honest to goodness, actual object, I can measure it with a ruler. If it were an abstract mathematical object, I could try to measure it abstractly. Um, so these lengths have, have measures and the area has measures. And these are all features of the structure of the square. They all belong to the square itself. Now, the symmetries of the square are something else. They are the changes that can be made to the square without actually changing it. So let me be more precise. The symmetries are functions that can be applied to the square's area itself and to all the points and lines of the square, which, which in the long term, after they are applied, leave the square unchanged. So a function which rotates by 90 degrees after having been applied, leaves the square unchanged. And a function which switches things around backwards like this, giving a horizontal motion of reflection, um, leaves things unchanged after having been applied. And so these are the symmetries of the square. Now, if we, if we look at a different shape, like this parallelogram, then we get a different set of symmetries. This parallelogram still has symmetries. It no longer has a reflection symmetry. It ends up truly different when reflected. But it still has a rotation symmetry. Of course, it doesn't have a 90 degree rotational symmetry. It has a 180 degree rotational symmetry. It has uh, so fewer symmetries, but it has a more interesting and rich structure. It has two points which have acute angles and two points which have obtuse angles. It has two long sides and two short sides. So what you see here is a more detailed structural difference within this shape and a less detailed structural difference here. You see fewer symmetries as a result of the extra added structure, and you have more symmetries here as a result of the extra added structure. As a general rule, when structure is added to a shape, symmetries are taken away because the symmetries can't preserve that extra structure. So if I decorate one of the corners of my square with a smiley face or whatever, then it will lose all, some or all of its symmetries because, um, because I don't have smiley faces on the, all the other corners. So there's an example behind me of a, of a triangle. I've tried to draw an equilateral triangle on the whiteboard. It has certain structural characteristics, which are, which are noted over here, like length and area and even angle. Um, and it has certain symmetry characteristics. Uh, an equilateral triangle has a 120 degree uh, ref, uh, rotational symmetry, which is noted in red there. And it also has a reflection line, which is, um, which is shown on the board behind me. Um, that's not the only reflection line it, ha it has. It has uh, two other reflection lines. So the square also has reflection lines. And it can be interesting and informative to count the number of symmetries that these shapes have. Um, if you look at the triangle behind me and try to count how many symmetries it has, it has a 120 degree rotational symmetry one way. It has 120 degree rotational symmetry the other way. So that's two. Then it has three reflection lines, and that's five. And five seems like a very strange number to associate with a triangle, right? A triangle has three sides and three points. And why would it have five symmetries? Um, I've, because I've miscounted. Um, the, there, there is one more symmetry, which we will always regard as a symmetry, even though it's rather trivial. And we call it the trivial or identity symmetry. Um, once we recognize that symmetries are functions that leave the shape unchanged, there is one very easy function which leaves the shape unchanged. And that is the function which fixes everything in place. Now, every shape has that as its symmetry. Even the strangest of shapes, if you just apply the function that, takes, that does nothing, leaves every point fixed, then that's a symmetry of that, uh, of that shape. So that's a sort of a free symmetry that every shape has, the identity map that leaves every point exactly where it is. If we include that, then we get six for the triangle, which makes, uh, seems to make more sense. If we count the symmetries of the square, we'll end up with eight. We have four, well, we have three rotational symmetries, 
um, by 9180 and 270. Then we have uh, two diagonal reflection symmetries and two uh, vertical and horizontal reflection symmetries. So that brings us up to seven. And then we have the, the null operation, which leaves, leaves everything fixed. Some people like to think of that as a zero degree rotational symmetry, but it's not really rotation if it leaves everything fixed. Um, this shape has only the two symmetries. It has the 180 degree rotation and it has the null operation that just leaves everything fixed. So as a general rule, the more structure a shape has, the fewer symmetries it has. If we look at a circle, something different happens. All of the points on the circle, all, all the points on the boundary of the circle are equivalent and inter interchangeable. And so any rotation, at least so long as the center of the rotation is at the center of the circle, any rotation will leave the circle unchanged. And that means that the circle has infinitely many symmetries, uh, which distinguishes it from all these other examples. Now, okay, so we've talked about the, the basic elements of the structural characteristics of the shape and the, the basic symmetries of the shape. Now, what I wanna do is I wanna take this discussion and I wanna move it on to the canvas itself, the plane on which these shapes are drawn. So the closest thing you have in this video to the canvas itself is the whiteboard behind me, but that's not truly the Euclidean plane. First of all, it's not infinite in all directions. Wouldn't it be nice? Um, that version was too expensive on Amazon. Um, so it's not infinite in all, uh, in all directions. Um, it's also not perfectly flat. Uh, I mean, it's made to be flat, but that doesn't mean that it's perfectly flat. It's also not perfectly two-dimensional. The thickness of the thing is actually relevant here. So um, the best model of it that we have is the whiteboard, but I want you to use a model in your brain instead, an idealized, infinite, perfectly flat two-dimensional structure. We're going to call that the affine plane. Now, that's the structure into which the shapes of geometry should be drawn. And we're not used to thinking of it sort of in and of itself. It's the, it's the environment into which we draw those shapes, but we're not used to thinking of it as a shape itself. But I'd like you to think of that plane as a shape, right? It's a very simple shape. It doesn't have very much structure. It's just flat and continuing in all directions, but it is a shape. And that shape itself has certain symmetries. It also has certain structure. You might think it has no structure at all because you know what, what's going on, there's nothing there, but it does have certain structure built in. And let's talk about the structure that's built in to the basic Euclidean plane, which we'll call the affine plane. The built-in structure of the affine plane is really um, two kinds of information. Uh, the first kind of information is it has distance, right? For any two points on that plane, one can measure the distance between them. And so there is a basic notion of distance, which is inherent to the points of the affine plane. Now, I can't say the affine plane has a distance of five centimeters or something like that. There's no definite distance because there are no uh, definite points that I've labeled. But if I do label the points, then I will get distances between them. And that distance measurement is built into the affine plane and part of its structure. The other built-in measurement that we have here is angle. Arguably, area as well is a built-in measurement, but that can be deduced by the, by the basic notion of distance. And so we'll just deal with these two. There are, there are two basic structures built in, and that's distance and angle. Now, you might think, well, wait a minute, he's forgotten one or two. What about the x-axis? What about the y-axis? What about the origin? What about the way that we measure the points by coordinates? Well, when we talk about the affine plane in the geometric context, we don't treat those features as built in. In fact, we treat them as sort of extra. If I draw, picture a line through the geometric plane, right? Just a line. Now, if, if we're looking at the same line, you can label the line and say, here's the origin and here's the, here's the zero. It's the real line, here's zero, it's the number line. I'm gonna put a zero here, I'm gonna put a one here, I'm gonna put a two here. But if it's just some line stretching across the Euclidean plane, what, what, by labeling it zero and one and two and calling it the number line, you're actually adding extra information. That information is not built in to a simple line. And in the same way for the affine plane, the information about where the x-axis lies, where the y-axis lies, where the origin is and what are the coordinates of the points, that's not built in, okay? So the affine plane doesn't sort of come with an origin. Or if you like to think about it another way, it has an origin, but the origin is not labeled, so we don't know where it is. Or to think about it another way, the origin can be added, but you're adding extra information when you declare it. 
the X and Y axes can be imposed on the plane. They can be drawn into the plane, but they can be drawn into the plane wherever you like, so long as you use per perpendicular lines. And so they're not inherently part of the structure. So that's an important difference between the coordinate plane that we work with in a calculus course and the affine plane that we work with in a geometry course. The origin is not labeled, the x and y axes are not there, and the coordinates of points are not given a priori, they're not given up front. That means they're not part of the basic structure of the plane. That means that changing the coordinates of the points doesn't, doesn't interfere with the structure of the plane. And so that brings us to the basic symmetries of the plane itself. Now, I just want you to think of a, a completely undecorated affine plane, uh, a Euclidean plane into which no figures have been drawn. Now, because no figures have been drawn, it has numerous symmetries, right? It has many different ways that it can move. But those symmetries have to respect the basic structural characteristics. You can't just move points around willy-nilly. They have to respect the basic structure of distance and angle. So what kind of maps on the Euclidean plane respect the basic notions of distance and angle? Well, there are three basic types and combinations of them which respect distance and angle as, but are interesting motions of the Euclidean plane. So let's talk about them in turn. The first is the translation. The translation is just a uniform motion, one way or another way, up or down, in a diagonal direction, it doesn't matter, just all the points move in a certain given direction. A translation might move that triangle over there to its counterpoint over here by simply shifting it along. So if we just shift something along the plane, this is, it doesn't rotate, it doesn't turn anything, it just shifts it along, up, down, left, right, or some combination of them. That's called a translation. Translations are symmetries of the plane because they preserve all of the structure. A translation doesn't change the distance between two points. It changes the locations of the points, but not the distance between them. If you have two points at a distance of three centimeters apart, and then you just move them, then they're, where they end up will be three centimeters apart. So that's the first kind of symmetry of the affine plane itself. The second kind of symmetry that we're gonna to have to deal with is the symmetry of rotation pin a point in place and rotate the plane around that point. Now, um, points move, right? But distances between two points don't get altered by rotating the entire plane. And angles uh, don't get changed by rotating the entire plane either. And so a rotation is a symmetry. And the last symmetry that we'll be looking at is the reflection symmetry. And that's this back and forth here between these shapes. Um, we just have to turn it back, or it's also notated here as this reflection line. The reflection symmetry is like a mirror symmetry. All the points on one side of the line move to the other side, all the points on this side move back to the other side, and everything preserves distance. So points closer to the line shift and trade places and, and remain close to the line. Points far from the line trade places and remain far from the line. Um, so this is a bit of a, this is a slightly stranger motion. But this motion doesn't change the distance between two points. If you have two points over here and then you reflect them across the line, then they will remain equally far apart. And it doesn't change the sizes of angles either. Now, there are infinitely many of these translations and infinitely many of these rotations and infinitely many of these reflections as well. And that might seem a little bit unwieldy and it is unwieldy. Um, together, we call these transformations or sometimes we call these congruence maps. Um, so we, uh, we deal with all of these functions as the symmetries of the plane because they help us tell when things are equal. So let me go back to the square itself, okay? So the square has certain features. It has points, it has edges. Now, the square has certain symmetries. It has a 90 degree rotational symmetry. And because I can move this point to this point by applying that 90 degree rotational symmetry, I know that this point and this point are the same. Now, they're not the same in the sense that they're identical. After all, this one is here and this one is here and they're not, you know, they're not identical, but they are interchangeable. They are effectively the same. They are, we might say, congruent. So they're not only congruent, but they're sort of play the same role in with respect to the square. So um, what the symmetries really do is they allow, they, they reveal to us when certain features of a shape are the same as or effectively the same as other features of the same shape. 
If we take that up a level to the entire Euclidean plane, which we'll call the affine plane, in the context of the entire Euclidean plane, a transformational symmetry, which might shift this along, uh, might identify one triangle getting transformed to another triangle. And because one triangle moves and lands exactly on top of another triangle by means of a transformation, um, we could say that the triangles are effectively the same, or the proper word in geometry is congruent. So we are able to identify congruence as a side effect of the symmetries of the plane. Because one shifts to the other, they are congruent. This is a different setup, a different notion of congruence than what might be um, than what might be more familiar to you or or more usual. Usually, we determine congruence by saying, well. Uh, the lengths have to all be the same and the angles have to all be the same. So I should go over and I should measure these three lengths and check the angles and I should measure these three lengths and angles and I should verify that they're all the same and then I can say that they're congruent. But that's not how we're going to think about congruence. We're going to think about congruence as a symmetrical relationship between these things. There is a symmetry of the affine plane itself which shifts one to the other and because it lands exactly on it, then it's congruent. So our notion of congruence is going to be secondary to our notion of symmetry. This is more consistent with common core, and this is a powerful way of thinking about things, but it is a little bit strange. So um, this has been a brief intro to structure and symmetry of the affine plane. And what we're going to do moving forward is we're going to characterize these transformations, and then we're going to talk about how we can use them, uh, how we can combine them to get new transformations, but also how we can use them to identify the characteristics of the geometric figures.